Uh, well, greetings, friends. It's Danielle Smith, president of Alberta Enterprise Group. We are going a little bit early today, and we're going to try to move to a, a new time as we get into the fall, just because there's so much going on. And uh, going back to the original time, you got you got used to me airing, and it just allows for us to to do more things throughout the the course of the day. So, just so you, in case you uh, are tuning into this later, you'll be able to get the whole thing online uh, because we do it by podcast as well. So this is a follow-up for one of the stories that we did before on lithium. We had Mark Klippenstein, who's with the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association, get in touch with us and say, hey, maybe it's time for us to do some kind of follow-up on hydrogen. And I thought, what a great idea, especially since there's quite a bit of controversy now with a New York Times editorial or news story that covered a very controversial paper that we want to go through. I want to be careful about how I go through it because the lead author on it, Mark Jacobson, is apparently quite litigious. So we want to just stick to the facts. And the best person to do that is my next guest. As I mentioned, I'm joined now by Matthew Klippenstein. I'm sure I said Mark again. I know that's your calling. Matthew Klippenstein, who is with the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. Matthew, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, thanks, uh, Danielle, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So I want to, you know, I'm trying to figure out the best way of getting into this issue because the thing that frustrates me the most is that every time anyone comes up with a solution to address environmental issues and in particular greenhouse gas emissions, there is an immediate dogpile by the wind and solar to the exclusion of all other enthusiasts trying to demonize any potential new development. And so I'm, I'm, I'm worried that they're going to try to do this again in the context of hydrogen made from methane, which uh, has already been tagged as blue hydrogen as opposed to green hydrogen. But I, I just wanted you to put that into some context for us so that I can understand why it is that every single solution being put forward is, is immediately discredited or discredited or an attempt to discredit it is made. Why does that happen? Sure. Um, I tend to slip. So I uh Oh, Matthew, so, for some yeah. reason we are having a problem with your, oh. yeah, you were having a problem with oh, your dear. feed. Shall we try that My answer again? Sure. Yeah. Am I am I back? Am I back? You're back. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, Go ahead. Uh, hopefully that's the only time. So I, to, to preface, I could be a little bit off the cuff. So any opinion is Matthew Klippenstein, not necessarily CHFCA. Uh, I do think that uh, maybe the nature of human uh, you know, communities and societies that there's a bit of identity politics. Um, there are some people who are purists, some people who are more sort of uh, you know widening the circle in their approach. Uh, I think the best way to, uh, to evaluate different climate technologies uh, as we work for a prosperous, uh, flourishing future, net zero, but flourishing, uh, is, to, is to evaluate technologies based on uh, their emissions, their benefits, their, their detriments. And so this, this comes to this, uh, this blue hydrogen paper that you're referencing. Um, maybe if I, give, if, I, if I give the three sentence uh, summary of it is, um, Climate policy experts who rarely agree with each other, even the ones who are, 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 aren't very much fans of hydrogen or fuel cell vehicles uh, to begin with, uh, pretty much in unison have uh, derided or uh, rubbished, I guess is one word. Um, they use stronger words in Britain uh, to uh, the paper. And what I want to emphasize is that like the math seems to be sound in the paper, but it's the assumptions that have been made which are giving a different, a partial context instead of a full context. And, and I want to, so, you yeah. know, Matthew, I want to go through some of that in detail, but I, I mm -hmm. want to maybe walk through the, the positive case for hydrogen. And then Absolutely. we will talk about the positive case for blue hydrogen. And mm -hmm. then we will talk about whether we should even be calling it blue hydrogen anymore. I guess it's the, it, the, the idea of creating categories is, the, is problematic for me. I think we should be talking about zero emissions hydrogen or circular mm -hmm. economy hydrogen but we can mm -hmm. we can get to we can get to uh, terminology sure. in just a minute but i Absolutely. i think i've got some listeners who aren't even persuaded that mm -hmm. hydrogen is a worthwhile energy source to pursue and so i want to see if we can if we can talk through some of that because first Absolutely. of all tell, tell me where we are in building out 
the the hydrogen infrastructures. I understand. Mm -hmm. I think we've got 42 filling stations in uh, in California, California. Yeah. and three in in British Columbia. So so tell me a little bit more about what the plan is for rolling that out. Sure. So um, maybe to give some professional background, um, I've worked on hydrogen fuel cells uh, most of my career. I've also spent time in renewables consulting, uh, some projects in Alberta actually, and electric car infrastructure. So I have a fairly broad base. Um, one thing to remember about uh, hydrogen is that fuel cell, fuel cell vehicles get all the attention, but hydrogen is a much vaster uh, galaxy or a universe of energy uh, supply than just for vehicles. Uh, the primary uses for hydrogen in the world today are with refining, uh, uh, the manufacture of ammonia for fertilizer. And in the future, we expect to use uh, hydrogen to replace natural gas and coal and steel and cement manufacture, which are humongous global industries. So the fact that we don't have much refilling infrastructure right now for vehicles doesn't mean hydrogen isn't mm -hmm. you know, on the cusp of going big. It's just that for this one little niche, you know, this last little Lego piece in the huge Lego set, um, yeah, it's not as far developed as uh, as other technologies. Now. Well, let's talk through that a bit because I think it's important for people to understand that it already is a proven technology and proven applications mm -hmm. in some of those other areas because that actually makes yeah. sense. Uh, the, the issue is that you kind of want the fueling stations because that's the outward facing, public facing that's um, right. uh, communication strategy of saying, hey, look, this is that's being right. used here. What else is it being used for? We're going to have to back end load yeah. this. So tell us mm -hmm. how, how uh, hydrogen is used in refining because it, it goes a, a ways to explaining why it is Alberta is a natural place to form a hydrogen hub. Exactly. Yes. So uh, Alberta right now uses about 5,400 tons per day of hydrogen. And again, that's mostly in the oil refining sector. Uh, when you produce, a, when you obtain crude oil from the ground, usually you have to upgrade it. You have to refine it, refineries, into the different finished products that you need from uh, diesel, gasoline, um, you know, kerosene maybe for jets and other fuels like that. And so right now, um, the cheapest source of hydrogen is natural gas. And Alberta has lots of it as well as the oil, as well as the bitumen. Uh, and furthermore, uh, until recently, there was no price on carbon. So why wouldn't you use the hydrogen and just vent the CO2? Uh, the, the joke in Vancouver is that, yes, we use a lot of uh, water, but uh, that's because we're not actually metered for our water. So of course, why wouldn't we? And so a lot of the um, uh, uh, many concerns, people have valid concerns that, well, hydrogen, we pull it from natural gas, you vent the CO2. Well, of course you do. It's just it hasn't been priced yet. Uh, society hadn't decided on putting a price on it. So that's just how it happens to have been made uh, historically. And I should yes. mention, they call that, they, they've got color codes for everything. Mm -hmm. That one's called gray hydrogen, right? That's right. That's right. Um, I, I'm not sure who came up with the color codes. They, uh, I'm sure they start off as a good intentions. Uh, there is now a rainbow of colors, which people can't keep track of, which speaks to your point of wanting to talk about what are the emissions, because ultimately that's what we're after. And we'll get to more about emissions in a second. I, sure. I want to talk through the, the case for hydrogen. Second mm -hmm. one you'd mentioned was um, ammonia. So, t so tell me how it is that hydrogen is used in the, in the creation of fertilizer. Right. So fertilizers, I believe the stat is that synthetic fertilizers help feed more than half the, half the population. And uh, what you, the way that you make ammonia for fertilizer, ammonium nitrate, other, other things, is that uh, you react uh, nitrogen from the air. I think you separate the nitrogen from the air and you need hydrogen. So for now, we use natural gas for that. Enormous, enormous amounts of natural gas. Mm -hmm. And of course, you wind up creating CO2 again because we didn't use to price CO2. It didn't used to be a big deal. Uh, going forward, and already I believe this is, uh, this is already in use in Alberta. I, I'm not sure if the country is nutrient, but it's somewhere along there. There's a 50 kilometer hydrogen pipeline in Alberta already actually, uh, where uh, the, it's just hydrogen that's used. Uh, to feed directly without the CO2 attached or the carbon attached. Hmm. So again, it's a mature process. And in Alberta, you know, this is a, a very, it's like a, a, a central node, not quite ground zero for hydrogen in Canada, but very much a, a beating heart of, of where we'll, uh, we'll see a lot of industrial hydrogen expansion. Talk to me a little more about the chemistry that's going on there, just so that I understand. So we use methane and it's the hydrogen molecules that we that's need right. in order to make the fertilizer. And that is what ends up once you've created that chemical process, then you've got the CO2 that's being emitted. Is that, have right. I got that right? That's right. So methane CH4, uh, what we use in refining in, uh, in ammonia 
is we use the, the H, the H is there, and then the C winds up turning into CO2 and we vent that. How uh, that. simple... How simple a process is it in both of those applications to capture the CO2? Now that we've got a price, we know the price mm -hmm. is going up to $170 per ton if the Liberals mm -hmm. win and keep on winning to 2030. Right. Um, so it, now that we know that what the price is going to be, uh, obviously, I think that's caught the attention of um, of those who have to innovate in this area because mm -hmm. I'm hearing about net zero pretty well every single right. call I have with the mm -hmm. business owner. But is it, a, is it a, a fairly simple process to figure out how yeah. to capture the CO2? CO2 in both of those applications because it's concentrated at source. Maybe you can tell us where, where we're at Absolutely. on that. Absolutely. That's right. So um, if, you, uh, if you extract your hydrogen from uh, natural gas and you produce CO2, then you capture it and then you inject it underground, then we have what's called blue CO2 or blue, sorry, blue hydrogen rather, blue hydrogen. And so um, the process to capture it is well established. It's a, uh, uh, we have some Canadian companies who are leading in this field, in fact. Uh, I believe uh, the cost to do this depends on how concentrated it is in the feed stream. Mm. And uh, I have had offhand conversations that, yeah, maybe 50, maybe a little bit more dollars per ton of CO2. And when you think about uh, if the carbon price is going up to $170 a ton, then you're going to capture that carbon. Now, one of the tremendous, tremendous advantages Alberta has is um, you know, I was not a fan of Stephen Harper, but he did build the Alberta a carbon trunk line which is a large uh, CO2 exclusive pipeline, which injects the CO2 into the ground. Uh, Shell also has a carbon capture pipeline and injection point in Alberta, that's a Quest project. Mm -hmm. And so it may be true that in many parts of the world, there is no carbon pipeline, there is no carbon burial or sequestration infrastructure. Well, Canada, Alberta has that. And so it's, this is a case where you can apply a technology which will be much cheaper uh, than the carbon taxes you're going to pay with infrastructure that's already there. Uh, and so it's a very positive thing uh, in Alberta in particular, uh, where critics might uh, talk about, you know, are you going to build a pipeline? How are you going to bury it? In, in Alberta's case, you have uh, resolved that. And there is a lot of capacity to, to bury the CO2. That's sort of, it's an, I'm glad you framed it that way, because mm. I know that there's been a lot of freak out over the fact that our CO2, um, our, our carbon emissions tax is going to go up to $170 mm -hmm. per ton. But I think that point is worth underscoring. Mm -hmm. What company is going to sit back and just casually pay $170 per ton mm -hmm. in carbon taxes when they can install this this technology and it would only cost $50 per ton? Right. And if we go down the, the line, presumably, because this is what entrepreneurs do, is they find mm -hmm. ways to innovate so they make things mm -hmm. cheaper. So we end up with lower costs. I'm also wondering if we're going to ultimately end up monetizing that stream. I've been thinking more mm -hmm. of CO2 as a feedstock just because of some mm -hmm. of the applications that I've been I've been hearing might be possible in the future. Would you mind mm -hmm. talking a, a bit about that? Because sure. I want to understand the sort of the two avenues. First of all, the, the storage capacity, which you've already made reference to. And then I also want to get some sense of, of um, whether we could turn this into mm -hmm. a stream for useful products. So right. talk to me first about the storage capacity, because I've heard mm -hmm. uh, ca uh, that Alberta's storage capacity is immense. Give me some sense of what you know. That's right. So storage capacity, um, I believe the Alberta Carbon Trunk Pipeline uh, can handle 15 million tons of CO2 per year. That much burial and uh, Canada's overall emissions are like 730 million tons like it's not insubstantial and it's not like that's the only pipeline you could ever build to sequester carbon so it is it is massive um, mm -hmm. BC now by fluke of luck we have hydroelectric power not that much heavy industry uh, our emissions are like what 70 million tons per year so um, again 15 million tons per year that's that's a huge amount that you can avoid emitting now um, uh, critics will say that, uh, you know, for now, a lot of the carbon sequestration that's been done here and in Texas uh, has been used for enhanced oil recovery. And that's very true, but it speaks to the fact that there wasn't a carbon price before. If you have a high enough carbon price, you're going to tell the person who owns that depleted, sort of a geologically lower pressure uh, oil field region, uh, just don't pump the oil. You know, it's otherwise we get we get docked points because the oil will eventually have CO2 um, produced from it. Uh, so that, that I just want to speak to that. 
Um, as Can I before we before we leave the storage component? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. The because the amount that you can take on an annual basis and put underground is one aspect of it, and I, I take mm -hmm. your point that you can build greater capacity and so mm -hmm. be able to do more of that. But do we know what the geologic capacity is for carbon dioxide to be stored underground? I think though, geologists will know this because they mm -hmm. spend a lot of time with seismic and understand what we have mm -hmm. under the under the surface. But there's there's sort of two aspects to it. How much space do we have? So right. how much how long could we keep on doing mm -hmm. this? How much could we store down there? Right. And then the other aspect is, would it end up finding its way back to the surface again? Is there right. seepage that would occur? So this is not a permanent solution. So just deal with the first one if you can. Do, do we know mm -hmm. what our capacity is here? Sure, so, so I'm not gonna bullshit you to, to claim that I do know. <laughs> uh, I have read it though, and uh, it does seem enormous, uh, particularly in Alberta, just with the geology that you guys have. Um, I guess one way to think about leakage, uh, then moving on to leakage is that um, Right now, our oil or natural gas, helium even, helium is associated with natural gas, uh, is, is trapped under these salt domes. It's just rock formations that don't allow them to escape the atmosphere. And, um, you know, using a typical scientific approach, that stuff's been underground for, what, three billion years, something like this? So uh, I'm sure there's a way to store the CO2 forever. Uh, we haven't proven the ability to do so, but then... I mean, at that stage, it's like we've only proven agriculture for like 10,000 years or something like um, I would still think I still think that future uh, Canadians would prefer to deal with CO2 uh, that hadn't been already in atmosphere uh, than to have to deal with it uh, uh, today and, and every year going forward. Uh, I can twist that a little bit now if you want to talk on the monetization part, uh, because that starts to get into a very interesting uh, uh, point. Uh, there are ways to monetize carbon dioxide. Uh, one, uh, one approach, I believe it's now in 1% of all cement manufactured worldwide, is that you can capture the CO2 that a cement plant produces and then inject it as micro bubbles into the cement or into the concrete itself. Uh, that actually strengthens the concrete. There are other, other very cool approaches. Uh, I believe there's an Alberta-based um, sort of collection of, uh, of efforts to utilize the carbon dioxide, which is very exciting. Uh, the one challenge we have with CO2 is that it's produced at such scale that even if you monetized everything, that's uh, every possible use, you're probably still only going to have one small part of the CO2 coming from fossil fuels. How? Oh, Matthew, I think, hold on just one sec. I may need you to restart that uh, that answer because we've got a problem with your with your feet again so, uh, you can you can blame british columbia is that uh, what it is you got, okay. <laughs> i figured okay that, okay so try that again so you said that right. we're having i'll tell you where we got you you said that we sure, sure. have the, the problem we're, we're looking at monetizing it the problem mm -hmm. is that there's going to be such a large volume that it's only that's going right. to be a portion of the stream but you're about to go into some of the things that you're hearing about that we can monetize that's right so uh so we can monetize it but just co2 is produced from human activity in such a large scale it's, it's hard to find a use for all of that. Now, one promising uh, approach for Alberta, and I think this will be a very big topic of discussion in the next 10 years, is what if you could get the hydrogen off of the methane, off the natural gas, without producing CO2 in the first place? Uh, this is a process known as pyrolysis. Um, basically, you heat the stuff up, uh, maybe you run an electric current through it, and then what you get is hydrogen and carbon powder, carbon black. Uh, carbon black is a big element of tires, computer cables, you know, computer inks, things like that. But the main use is tires. Uh, and then what you have is you have um, uh, you have a lot of hydrogen which is produced, and you don't have CO two to worry about, and you can sell the byproduct carbon. If you flood the market with byproduct carbon, it's a solid, so you can, I assume, just bury it underground in those wells which are you know, which which are depleted in terms of reservoir pressure. So. Um, I think that we would see in the next decade uh, many blue hydrogen projects going forward with very high carbon, carbon capture. That's excellent. Uh, I do think that instead of spending money to capture the CO2, there will be intense interest from many players. Um, well, what if we don't produce the CO2 in the first place? We don't have to separate it. Um, you know, can we make the hydrogen cheaper uh, and then and never have to worry about the cleanup? So I'm very, very hopeful about this. There is an industrial scale facility. This isn't just lab stuff. Uh, there is an industrial scale facility uh, helping with 
uh, blue hydrogen-based ammonia in Nebraska. They produce about hmm. 12 tons per day. So this is real. It's not a lab. It's, it's really here. And, and in fact, um, there was a European company, Caverner, who invented this process in 1999, but no one was interested because there was no price on carbon for anyone. So, um, so this, is, this is something that is at industrial scale. We can help it uh, scale up. I'm hopeful that across Canada we can, we can build these projects because this allows us to get all that concentrated energy under the ground, uh, of which Alberta has a lot, use that energy from hydrogen without actually producing CO2 and having all the worries and you know, understandable fears about CO2 and politics about CO2 um, that, uh, that we can help push towards net zero in a very uh, you know, flourishing and prosperous way. Well, let, let me uh, also add a bit of a shout out to a company I know of in Medicine Hat called CanCarb. I've been wanting to get down there to have oh, another yeah. visit with them because they produce carbon black for the purpose of producing O-rings for spaceships and all the rubberized mm -hmm. uh, rubber that you've got on your vehicles. And I and they've got this, this process that sounds very much like what you just described with pyrolysis, mm -hmm. where they take methane, split out the hydrogen, use the hydrogen yeah. to split up more methane, and they're seeking the, the carbon black to be able to do it. And I just wonder, right. can you talk more about why it is there is such a scale of CO2? Because when we talk about CO2 in the atmosphere, we're talking about parts per million. That's and right. so that's yeah. a fraction of a percentage mm -hmm. and it's nowhere near how much nitrogen we have in the atmosphere. Yeah. And so it, it strikes me that it doesn't sound like a lot. Why, why is it that, that it is um, a volume that you don't think we would be able to, to fully be able to utilize? Oh, okay. I guess, sorry. What I, what I mean is that the production in terms of tons per day of CO2, even if you inject it into concrete, even if you, um, uh, what you used it as a precursor for certain polymers um, that's actually done in Germany at very modest scale right now today. Uh, even if you mixed it with water for greenhouse agriculture and, and things to make the leaves slightly acidic, which kills off pesticide, it kills off pests without the use of pesticides. Uh, even with that, there's a whole amount, a huge amount of CO2 that uh, there's, just, there's so much volume we produce. We can't, we can't, we don't know yet, I guess, uh, all the different ways to use it. Um, on the CO2 question, I suppose one way that, that might help to think about things is that, like right now, the average Canadian might eat, what, 2,000 calories a day, I don't know, 8,000 kilojoules, whatever that is. Um, but if you go through the, the various government reports, we actually use about 200,000 calories a day just in the energy in our embedded goods to move our cars for, for all the things that give us the long lifespan, low infant mortality, all these, you know, the internet, uh, even if the video sometimes crashes. Uh, thank you, internet service provider. Um, so one way, so so one thing that might help is that yes, individual were small, but our actual energy footprint, our calories per day input is the same as a blue whale. It's about hmm. again two hundred thousand calories per day. And if you think of a world of seven, eight million humans, not all of whom are all that rich, most of whom aren't nearly as rich then okay we look small but if you think of a world from like a hundred thousand to seven and a half billion blue whales yeah they probably have a little bit of a swing in the whole ecosystems and stuff now this immediately uh, gets into questions of morality and are you this and that and uh, i i think the uh, i think a sensible uh, thing is that we would want everyone to be able to advantage uh, have the material advantages and the good fortune that we have uh, it's just that we want to avoid the detriments you know, to the best of our ability uh, so that again our kids and grandkids don't have to you know pay for things that we started I'm, i haven't ever heard um our energy consumption described that way that'd be like having mm -hmm. a two hundred thousand calorie a day diet it seems That's like right. the uh, the vision being put forward by the mm -hmm. environmentalists is we got to go on a diet and we've got to cut that's that, right. yes, that yes, uh, yeah. use of calories. But that's not what I'm hearing you say. You're talking mm -hmm. about flour. You talked a couple of times whenever you talk about net zero, mm -hmm. and you also talk about flourishing. So right. you, you don't you don't want this to be an, a future that we're looking forward to where we all have to bring our standard of living down mm -hmm. to where the poorest people on the planet are. There, right. you, it sounds to me like you're you're talking about bringing everybody up to the same level, but doing so that's in right. a way that has less impact on the environment. And I, I think what we're often being told is that's not possible. Why do you think it is possible? So yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great point. Um, just as on the right of the spectrum, you have like social conservatives and libertarians and people like that. 
you have on the left a, a bunch of differences. And in the uh, in the environmentally conscientious movement, I, environmentalist is kind of a tricky word, uh, you do have, uh, there is definitely a feeling of, um, some people have a feeling of wanting to shrink our footprint. I think, I think we should shrink our footprint. Um, there is, there comes out maybe uh, uh, from some folks the, the impression that, uh, you know, we have to be, we have to consume less, we have to do less, um, we have to do everything with, with efficiency. And in my own experience, um, you know, once I got past my pigheadedness, uh, as I tried to approach other people, I think the framing and the description that, you know, we want, we do want everyone to flourish. You know, part of that means reducing our CO2 emissions so we don't have to pay for future costs. But ultimately, ultimately, it is very hard to tell someone, you know, you need to go on a diet, uh, especially if, as a Canadian, you know, my per capita emissions and consumption is so much higher than someone in China or let alone India. Uh, and so, uh, this really transformative book I can recommend um, is uh, it's called Creating Climate Wealth. I just sent the, the, the JPEG to you uh, by a fellow named Jigger Shaw. And uh, he's very prominent in the United States. Uh, right now he works, I believe, at the Department of Energy at the moment. Uh, and a thing that I would say to you know readers, listeners, or, or uh, you know video watchers here is that you know he's he's sort of right wing. Like he's he's not. I'm a leftist. I'm a non-judgmental, but I am far left. Uh, and so, you know, uh, his ideas don't really accord with mine. But I think in this book, this seminal book, he's saying, well, look, you know, that's not the, you can't, you can't inspire change by saying we have to go on an energy diet. That's not the, the, the nature of human, human nature. He says, well, look, look at all the wealth we can create. Look at all the resources we can you know, bring out of the earth without pollution, cheaper with these new technologies. And I think uh, for people of a more right-wing bent, I think that would be a really catalyzing read. Um, just to give a bit of description on him, uh, uh, if I may. So yes. he, invented the, he invented the no money down solar uh, um, business model. He said, well, look, these solar panels will, look, will last 20 years. A lot of homeowners don't want to spend 10,000, or maybe it's 5,000 by now to build, put solar panels on. Um, but we know they're going to last. We have the insurance data. Why don't we uh, do a lease financing arrangement where you know, we borrow money from a bank at, I don't know, 10% a year. And we say, look, you know, you don't have to pay another dollar uh, per month on your uh, energy bills. You get, you get the same amount. We will take the savings and we will calculate that the savings are going to be enough to pay for the solar panels. No friction. There's no, there's no tightening of your belts to, to find that 5000 or $10,000. And, and again, this guy is far more right wing than me. I want to emphasize that. Uh, but in my experience in the years since uh, I've, I've been listening to him and, and uh, I ha I've had the very good privilege of corresponding with him, he's a wonderful fellow, uh, I think that is the right framing. The scolding uh, approach of, you know, we're being too much, or even worse, you, but not me, uh, is consuming too much. I don't think that's constructive. Uh, I think we get to net zero a lot faster with less heartache if we focus on these opportunities. Um, Matthew, I've got to I've got to get you to to do a reversal because I'm sure that yeah. some of my listeners are hung up on you saying that you're very far left because yes, everything yes. we've talked about <laughs> so far, you just don't sound like you're very far left. And well, so yeah. and so this is and I look at myself as being an environmentalist, but I don't like using that terminology because it of seems course, like yeah. environmentalism this these days means that you've got mm -hmm. to exclude a number of different options. I think one mm -hmm. of the, you know, I want to I want to mention this to you, and I want to get you to comment on it because one of the frustrations that I've seen, and uh, Michael Schellenberger is is a, another yes, example. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. So he began as somebody who also believed that wind mm -hmm. and solar were the solution, and and then he talked. He developed this term, and I've spoken to him a couple times about it, of energy density. And when you look at energy right. density. Mm -hmm. The, the, for him, the energy that makes the most sense is nuclear. He's not he's That's not right. opposed to natural gas, but he thinks nuclear really mm -hmm. is the wave of the future. Right. But it's been demonized, even, even right. maybe to a greater extent in mm -hmm. a lot of cases than than some of the traditional fossil fuels. And I'm mm -hmm. I'm wondering what your take on on that issue is. Oh, for sure. Um, I guess yeah. On the comment that I'm far left, um, uh, I'm far left, but I don't push my ideas on others. And I try to look for points of commonality. Now, if we were having this conversation 15 years ago, I would probably fit most caricatures, you think. But uh, I've had a lot more success. Um, 
I did outreach for the EV infrastructure program uh, for the BC government a couple of years ago for EV chargers for apartments and uh, and condos. And I think my my transformation over the years was very important because if you're going to talk about electric cars, a lot of people will say, you know, they don't fit my needs. And I have to have the respect for their lives and their needs to say, maybe not. You know, it's kind of on me to make sure they do. Otherwise, I can't expect you to change. You know, that's, that's kind of unreasonable. Uh, now, moving on to nuclear, yes. So I guess one quip I would make, uh, I do tend to be, again, far left. That's, that's just who I am. Uh, but I do try to be logically consistent. And so, so if you ask me, you know, uh, you know, should fossil fuel executives who've lied about uh, climate change since the 1970s, causing carbon emissions, be put into jail or, you know, brought to court, I'd say, yeah, I'm, I'm up with that. Uh, but then if you're also asking me, you know, should uh, leaders of certain, not all, certain environmental groups who lied about nuclear power, causing more CO2 to be emitted, you know, causing climate change, you know, also be brought to trial, I'd be like, yeah, that's kind of logically consistent. You know, I can't, I, I can't be hypocritical because in both cases, I mean, the lack of nuclear has directly resulted in more coal being built, right? So, hmm. yeah, it's a, I, I, I do want to be as, as fair and, and, and uh, consistent as possible. Nuclear is a very interesting story. Um, now, at the moment, uh, I, I, I strongly favor nuclear power plants. I'm saddened that some of the uh, nuclear power plants in Ontario are going to be decommissioned, uh, even if they're expensive. Well, a guy like me assumes a high social cost of carbon. I think it's worth keeping those guys uh, online to avoid them being replaced by natural gas or, or any coal that might be left. Again, this is Matthew speaking, not say just yet. Um, well, here's what I'm, I'd say. I don't think I don't yeah. think either should go to prison because you know mm -hmm. one of the things we never talk about is what would the world be like? How much human suffering and how much poverty would we mm -hmm. have if we hadn't had all of those additional calories to consume that was brought to us by That's all right. that wonderful energy? And so I I tend mm -hmm. to think of the that the the business leader of today just inherited a uh, a legacy system and now it's a matter of okay rules have changed and now we've, we've got mm -hmm. to figure out how to clean it up oh i i totally agree yeah um i i guess i was trying to specify just the just the folks who at the very top level made the conscious decision that okay let's let's do this this um smoke screen type stuff and i i'm imagining those people are all retired by this point uh, anyone, <laughs> if they're still anyone, with us if they're yeah if they're still with us um but yes, like I'm a chemical engineer by training, I think. Yeah. Uh, and again, you know, I'll absolutely acknowledge that, you know, fossil fuels have been the, th the single thing that have raised human quality of life in, in, in history, maybe, maybe agriculture, maybe agriculture. Uh, it's just that, you know, it's like that Batman movie line. If you live long enough, it's a villain. What's happened? Oh, hold um, on one more second. You just, you, you, you froze again. You were talking about a Batman villain. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, socialism. I have blah, to, blah, blah. you know, Matthew, you're going to hold on a second. We'll have to tell you where, where are we getting you from? Like, where, why, where, where is your. I'm not sure. I'm in like uh, the suburbs of Vancouver. Oh, so. uh, yeah. I'm very, very apologetic about that. Um, but uh, we'll have well, to. Well, I always think of Vancouver as being ahead of us on technology. So I feel right, pretty right. good that here we well, are I mean, in. Uh... <laughs> so I, I'm in the. Uh, I'm in the outer edges of the uh, the Vancouver suburbs, so I'm like the Neptune of the Vancouver suburbs. Uh, so, um, but just on the Batman villain part, right? If you live long enough as a hero, you you turn into a villain, and that's kind of what's happened. You know, I'm sure that in 40 years, 50 years, you know, there'll be something we discovered with wind and solar, and it'll be like, okay, use this new technology X, Y, Z. Uh, and so, I don't think it's a, I think it's just kind of a, a circle of life kind of a thing where, you know, fair or not, this is kind of what happens. Well, you uh, know, Matthew, I would just say we've already discovered that with wind and solar, that the, the crystalline silicon is made from coal-fired plants in um, in China and put together right. with Uyghur slave labor. Um, if right. you look at, as well, all of our wind turbines, I know that there's this idea that they're net zero, but they can't be net zero until steel is net zero and until mm -hmm. concrete is net zero, until the transportation to get them to the site is net mm -hmm. zero. So I, I think that there's a very narrow way in which we we look at energy. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm, I'm trying to broaden this out because when I, when I started off talking about what I'm worried about is that they're going mm -hmm. to demonize uh, hydrogen mm -hmm. made from methane 
yeah, mm -hmm. but captured the CO2 in the same way that they have with some of these other sources. I, I want to get your take on how realistic it is that, uh, like, it, can we, in your view, achieve mm -hmm. the goals that we're talking about uh, and maintain human flourishing if we completely phase out fossil fuels by 2030 or 2050? Uh, okay, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll take that in a few phases. Uh, hopefully, my internet will stay on. Um, the uh, so on the twenty thirty versus twenty fifty thing, there's a difference between trying to run an, a marathon tomorrow if you're out of shape like me, that give me a heart attack, versus training for a while to run a marathon. So you know, maybe by maybe in a couple of years, I could do that if I really tried. I think it's similar with respect to the net zero thing, and the key would be to get to make sure everyone has enough cheap energy to maintain very prosperous lifestyles and, and for the rest of the world, the majority world, to make sure they have more. And at the moment, um, even with uh, the imperfections in solar and wind, they are the cheapest um, variable or cheapest sources of kilowatt hours. Uh, now, um, speaking to the solar and wind, yeah, the uh, on an emissions basis, you know, gram CO2 per kilowatt hour of energy, uh, they are still a lot lower than natural gas coal. This isn't to say they're perfect. Once it's upon time, I would have tried to say they're perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. life, life throws you curveballs. Um, but uh, with respect to green steel, the fascinating thing is uh, the way to get green steel is to use low emissions hydrogen uh, instead of coal uh, to reduce the iron uh, from an iron ore, iron and oxygen mixtures, uh, to get the iron to make steel. So right now, um, funny thing, Solar has about four times the, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions as wind. Uh, wind turbines are mainly steel. You will probably see net zero uh, wind turbines in the next five to seven years. Hmm. Some, Europe, so, some European uh, steel facilities are like, we've tried this out at the uh, bench scale, the small commercial scale. We're going ahead, going ahead with a hydrogen powered steel uh, blast furnace, whatever they're called. Uh, and now, uh, again, uh, from my privileged position in Canada, first world country, I can't expect someone who is super, super price sensitive on steel uh, in India to be like, well, I'm going to make hydrogen with my steel because you need every rupee or whatever it is you need to, to raise your lifestyles. But as a consumer choice, as a branding choice in, uh, in, in many first world applications for cars, for wind turbines, for buildings, uh, I think a lot of people will pay a small premium to be able to say, hey, you know, this uh, this steel was produced without, you know, without coal, with, with green or with bl low emission blue hydrogen. And so um, maybe one thing I would say then is that one way to speed up uh, uh, the uh, uh, the transition to, to net zero is to call on, uh, I believe you guys call this virtue signaling, uh, uh, brands wanting to be like the cleanest. And, you know, I'm, you know, Apple, we're better than Google because we're, you know, renewables powered and our products are made with green aluminum or green steel. And so without, it's like you can make progress even, even as uh, people at the lower end of the, of the economic ladder, uh, you know, have to, have to satisfy themselves with the most cost efficient to bring their life, lifestyles up uh, solutions. So, um, Sorry, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit. No, so. no, it's a, it's a great point. I, I want to return to a couple of the other applications. So we've talked about how concrete and steel may will be ultimately using hydrogen. So tell me what the um, the process is of rolling out hydrogen fueling stations. What's the what's the barrier? What's the difficulty sure, to yeah. that? Uh, okay, absolutely. So this uh, this is a, a topic that I've worked on a little bit. I I helped out a little bit with the first hydrogen station in British Columbia. Now, um, <clears throat> maybe I'll say that uh, building hydro stations now, because it's kind of new, it's relatively uh, uh, a new thing to most people in most geographies, it would be a little bit like putting up your first cell phone networks in the 80s, like not even the 90s when we had like joked about the X-Files uh, cell phones, but in the 80s where it's like a new thing. It's like uh, communities might be, you know, is this safe, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and so from... From initiation point to the actual completion is maybe about two years uh, for a hydrogen uh, refueling station. These will generally be located at you know gas stations, things like that. Uh, it takes a lot longer than uh, putting in an electric charger. Uh, the hilarious thing is that in remote communities, if you want those super fast charging 
for your electric vehicle so they can charge in 10 to 20 minutes, uh, some of those things are going to start to use fuel cells to provide the on-demand electricity because the local grid can't handle it. So uh, even, even with a world of many uh, battery electric vehicles, which I love, they're fantastic, uh, there is still going to be a sizable role for hydrogen, even in the passenger cars. And as you move into larger vehicles, the, the, the market share, if you will, uh, for hydrogen will only increase. Talk, why does it take two years to be able to s install one of these filling stations? What's the, what's the, what's the detail behind that? Sure. Um, I haven't been involved in the, uh, in the intricate discussions on this. I'm imagining there's a fair amount of regulations uh, involved. Uh, I believe your side of the political spectrum is good at, uh, you know, smoothing those out. Um, so, uh, but so this but is the I reason why left it. and right need to talk um, more, right? Well, exactly. You guys tell us the problem, exactly. we'll throw them out of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. I mean, uh, um, I will, I will happily concede your guys' knowledge of economics uh, ex you know, exceeds mine. I can't speak for my my half uh, of, the, of the spectrum. Well, maybe but, I can uh, talk to you about a technical question then, because here's sure, what I sure. wasn't sure of is that. I wasn't sure if you have to create the hydrogen on site for the filling oh, station, okay. if that's the more efficient yep. way of doing it, or if not, mm -hmm. how do you transport it? Because I think that there mm -hmm. is a, a, an issue with it being transported in liquid form and, and the temperature it needs to be transported at. So what are the mechanics behind right. getting the hydrogen fueling station, the, the fuel to the fueling station? Right. Oh, yeah. Very good question. Very good question. So what is typically expected to happen what we what we see happening is that the hydrogen will be generated at sort of large facilities like uh, chemical facilities at the moment um you know a lot of gray hydrogen is produced this way and um it will be shipped generally as a liquid so it'll be cooled way 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 down and and shipped as a liquid and the reason is you can ship maybe a few tons of hydrogen versus maybe 500 kilograms of hydrogen as a compressed gas your labor costs, you know, to move it around, well, are substantial. Uh, and so at the station, uh, whether it's a, a very large compressed gas tank or a liquid, um, you have that, that, uh, that uh, tank there, much like a gasoline tank. Uh, and then it will, the, the gas will be dispensed and compressed up to the right pressure to be put into your vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, so you do need a little bit of space. It isn't, uh, it isn't as easy as just, you know, um, opening your nearest electric uh, outlet and plugging your car in. Uh, but it is very much worthwhile. Again, the analogy with cell phones is, is great because uh, a lot of people are very dismissive of hydrogen and, and fuel cell vehicles. And I like to remind them that in the 80s, you know, I think McKinsey told AT&T that by 2000, there would only be 100,000 mobile phones in the world, worldwide, right, ever. And the reason is, back in the day, landlines were cheap. They were everywhere, all the infrastructure. You know, phones that weren't expensive, cell phones had bad data quality, you know, bad voice quality. They were bricks. Um, every, every disadvantage you could think of, cell phones had. It's a little bit like the advantages that electricity has now mm -hmm. when there's a network, as opposed to hydrogen, where we're, we're starting to build a network. Uh, one of the cool things is that if we can lead in North America on the network, you know, California can do its thing, but if especially Canada wide, we can build that network out, we can have a lead on our neighbors to the south and our companies can like win the contracts as they more slowly build up their network. You have to deal with the safety issue because absolutely, yeah. Because people think that it's uh, explosive and flammable. I think mm -hmm. the Hindenburg is sort of an example people That's use. Right. Oh my yes. gosh, we haven't yeah. been able, we, we couldn't yeah. possibly be yeah. able to put this in the in a vehicle and drive it around. But what what mm -hmm. what, is, what has happened on the safety side that makes you confident that that cars will be adopted in that way? Sure. So on the safety side, um, maybe the statistic which is most useful. Uh, is that uh, right now Walmart and Amazon use fuel cell powered forklifts in a lot of their distribution centers. They're more productive than battery forklifts. And so their employees, you know, not, not exactly PhDs, you know, people who are blue collar workers, um, they refuel these, uh, these uh, forklifts many times you know, to, to do their runs. And uh, uh, Plug Power, this, this company, they have recorded in their little data tracking system 40 million four zero million uh, refuelings. Uh, so that's like one per person in Canada with a few left over. And uh, I think they had, uh, I think they had one safety incident in 40 million, which was traced to a manufacturing de defect. Uh, and so, I mean, 
I haven't filled my gasoline car 40 million times. And once I spilled gasoline on myself, um, don't tell my wife that was before we were married. And, uh, and so I would say that we do have the data to say that it's safe, but you know, me as an expert in my field, I can't expect, you know, someone else to be like, Oh, well, he says it's safe. It must be safe. Uh, there's a lot of education and outreach and training uh, that has to be done. And, you know, that's par for the course. So that is what uh, the industry will be doing. I'm interested to know a little more about the fuel cell aspect to this, because you, mm -hmm. you've said something that has also been important too, because I've, I've done segments before where mm -hmm. I've asked the question to someone who understands how our power grid works. Could mm -hmm. we, with our current power grid, electrify everything? Could we plug, everyone have an electric car that gets plugged in? And could we convert all home heating to electric? And mm -hmm. do we actually have the wires and capacity to do that? And you've given the impression that there is at the moment a capacity limit to how many electric cars that we can have. Can you talk a little more about that? Sure, I guess this goes back to the uh, running a marathon in, in a year from now versus tomorrow phenomenon. If magically, you know, the fairy EV mother turned all cars electric, yeah, we'd have some problems. Uh, but even with the federal government aiming for a 2035, I think for 100% of new cars being zero emission, that includes fuel cell vehicles, um, it'll be at least another 10 years before those other vehicles get off the road, the, mm -hmm. the remaining combustion vehicles. So we have a lot of time to map things out. Now that said, um, you, especially in a cold northern country like Canada, even with the best heat pumps for electric heating, it would not it would be a lot more expensive to build out the electric grid uh, to handle the highest peak days in the middle of winter uh, because you're only going to use that a few days a year right you're paying for this, this infrastructure which is being underutilized for the vast majority of the year and so a, a an all 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 hands on deck approach all of the above approach where you have gas energy to supplement the electric grid it uh is what is most cost effective, makes most sense. The only difference or the main difference is that uh, we'd be delivering hydrogen, low emissions hydrogen, instead of natural gas. Uh, this would require changing out some uh, some appliances and so forth. But again, this, we're not talking about the fairy godmother doing this overnight. We have a number of years to do this. So um, it's doable and the United Kingdom has an actual plan to do this. I believe by the year 2045, uh, where they will completely replace their natural gas systems with hydrogen systems. And we get a lot colder than the UK does. So, hmm. you know, them them acknowledging that, yeah, we need gas energy uh, to help supplement our electric energy in the winter. Uh, that's kind of our situation as well. Explain then what a fuel cell is. So I'm sort of I'm, I'm interested in understanding that, especially how it might use be used with existing charging technology, because I'm not I'm not even quite sure oh, okay. what happens with the hydrogen and why it is you need a fuel cell. Why can't it be burned right. just the same way natural gas is? Sorry, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I may have confused the situation there a little bit. Uh, so a fuel cell is a it's like a cousin to the battery. They're both electrochemical cells. Uh, the main difference is the battery holds all of its fuel inside the little canister. And a fuel cell is a, is, is a battery, similar um, a device, but the fuel is stored externally. So hmm. Now, same build load. And Matthew, uh, hang on one sec. We've got a, another little disruption in your, uh, in your yeah, feed. I'm, so we're waiting for it to recover, and then we can get you to restart that. So you were talking about fantastic. how... Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we got you. So we got right. the fuel cell. The fuel cell. You said that in a regular battery, the fuel's stored in this in the in the battery. But with the fuel mm -hmm. cell, the the fuel is external to it. Continue. Right. Yes, I guess this is the uh, this is the sign that uh, CHFC has to go back to in office uh, work here. So uh, the uh, the um, the fuel cell is basically a battery with an external storage tank. Now the uh, the fuel cells that we're talking about use hydrogen as their fuel and they react it with the oxygen in the air to produce water but also electric current and that's the electric current that you can use to help supplement the grid instead of building these massive infrastructure networks you can also have gas energy delivered to a bunch of places you know pipelines are less susceptible to winter storms uh, uh and you know, any sabotage or hackers i suppose uh than uh, than massive transmission towers and so you can you can deliver the energy in the hydrogen and then use the hydrogen, push it through a fuel cell and generate the electricity where you want. Uh, one, maybe one item, one factoid 
to give people a sense of the maturity of the fuel cell industry now. You know, we've had a lot of false promises over the years. Uh, there are now about 400,000 uh, 400, um, very small uh, micro uh, combined heat and power fuel cells, micro CHF, uh, CHP fuel cells deployed in Japan. Uh, they use natural gas, they strip the hydrogen off, uh, it does produce CO2, but uh, they use the fuel cell to produce about a kilowatt of electricity and then all the water needed to fill, to keep the, the family's hot water tank hot. Uh, and so this is a mature technology now, maybe 10 years ago, it wasn't as mature, but um, we have real deployments and uh, that I think is the, is the big reason that um, there is legitimate reason and uh, uh, it's appropriate to really push forward today because we're out of the lab, you know, we're in the, we're, we're almost in the living room practically. So talk to me about what happened in Japan, because even though there were advertisements during the Olympics for hydrogen, mm -hmm. I, I don't think they rolled it out as thoroughly. I don't think it was the showcase they initially intended it to be. Mm -hmm. So are there still some technical problems? Uh, there, um, I wouldn't say there are technical problems with uh, with fuel cells in Japan. I think the whole COVID thing kind of gave a big swerve to all of mm -hmm. Toyota's plans, as an example. Uh, they so Toyota has been one of the automakers that is most uh, bullish on hydrogen, even for passenger vehicles. Hyundai is the other, uh, and so their strategy is that you know it's not. It's like uh, people have different tastes. You know, uh, not everyone likes vanilla ice cream. And so uh, maybe not everyone wants a battery electric vehicle. So they're like, well, we're gonna keep offering hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. You know, uh, Yes, there's not much infrastructure today, but yeah, for cell phones back in the day, there wasn't either. And look where cell phones are now. And so um, I can't, I, I didn't watch the Olympics. Uh, we were uh, kind of heads down in a bit of a move to this, uh, this uh, poor internet connection community. Uh, but uh, but uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm confident that we'll still have progress. Uh, perhaps, perhaps the Olympics uh, were a bit of a bit of a miss on the uh, on the com communications front. Well, tell me, tell me uh, the cost issue because I've, I've often felt like if something was clearly cheaper and greener, it would be a no-brainer. You wouldn't have to push people in that direction. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, I talked to somebody who owns two Teslas and mm -hmm. a Leaf. And okay. that was the contention that they were making to me is that the technology is just getting better and better. And at some point we'll have a mm -hmm. tipping point where you're not going to have to force people to give up their mm -hmm. traditional ways of, of, uh, of, of traveling with a combustion engine vehicles. The, the, the economics are just going to make such sense to move. But mm -hmm. I don't think we're there that yet. And I don't know if you can tell us where we're at on a comparison basis. What did he tell me when driving his Tesla? He said he probably could get between Calgary and Edmonton with seven dollars worth of worth of charge i think yeah. he was even talking return whereas uh with gasoline it would take sixty dollars and then mm -hmm. he also said that uh, his payoff he believes on tesla because it's a more expensive vehicle of course he said he mm -hmm. figures his payoff was probably three and a half years because people mm -hmm. will make the case when you have to replace the battery that's where the big cost mm -hmm. comes in but if you're able to drive it for 10 or 15 years before you have mm -hmm. to pay off or buy a new battery and right. it has a three and a half year payoff, those economics yeah. still look pretty good. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to figure out where hydrogen, if there's some way of you uh, giving us some numbers that would be equivalent so that we can understand mm -hmm. how it compares. Yeah. Sure. So um, with hydrogen, like there aren't any hydrogen stations, uh, retail stations in, uh, in Alberta right now, it's a little bit more difficult. And I would say that automobiles are like the least, they're not totally non-cost sensitive, but if your friend has two Teslas and a Leaf, um, you know, electric cars are great, but there's no way the Tesla winds up cheaper than the Leaf because the Leaf starts off at a much lower price point. So cars are like a consumer good. Um, I have friends who are like, oh, I got a, you know, who have a Rolex watch. And for a, a blue collar guy like me, uh, I, uh, that's just out of my world. It's like, I struggle to see the logic of an Apple watch. Uh, what's wrong with a $10 watch? Uh, so consumer goods are different from, uh, from commodity goods, goods that businesses use. And here, uh, for high, you know, for, for trucking vehicles, uh, for these semi-trailers, which do the runs between Calgary and uh, Edmonton, for example, then uh, I think you do have hydrogen at the point where uh, possibly with a little bit of help or a little bit of time, you are cheaper on a total cost of ownership basis than diesel. Uh, if we're not already there, then we'll be there quite soon. 
uh, especially as the carbon tax goes up. And so um, my, uh, it's, that'd be my response. Um, uh, in certain applications, it's cost competitive. As we make hydrogen more cheaply and we price carbon more highly, uh, that will just keep on, uh, you know, there'll be more and more segments where it becomes competitive. So uh, the numbers I have in my head, and you'll have to tell me if I'm accurate on this, is that gray hydrogen, because you're not doing any carbon capture, mm -hmm. would be the cheapest. I think mm -hmm. a dollar per kilogram that's is how it was the, priced That's out. about the price, yeah. And then uh, at the other end, green hydrogen is the most expensive, probably $8 per kilogram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the one thing to keep in mind is it does cost money to perhaps liquefy it and compress it and deliver it to the station. So you do need to add a few bucks on that. I think Transition Accelerator, a big, uh, you know, very, uh, very a good group out of uh, Alberta, Edmonton, possibly. I think they were talking about something on the order of like wanting to get to four to five dollars per kilogram with low emissions hydrogen. Um, yes, it would be more expensive to do a blue hydrogen to do carbon capture. At the moment, the green hydrogen is more expensive because renewables are more expensive. Um, if you are in a place in the world like Saudi Arabia, Australia, maybe Chile, they've got a, the Atacama Desert there, you can, you'll can you be able to make green hydrogen very cost competitively, maybe approaching a dollar a kilogram in the next few years or next five to 10 years. The one key is to get it to Alberta will also cost you a few bucks a kilogram. And so even if the green hydrogen from other parts of the world is cheaper, uh, I do think that um, I'll just call it fossil-derived hydrogen, whether you capture the CO2, whether you don't make it in the first place, you make carbon uh, powder. Uh, I think that will have a strong a strong uh, a role to play. And, um, you know, to use that just transition phrase, which I love, and you probably don't, it's a perfect I'm example. Trying to, I'm trying to talk about transformation rather than transition. Okay. You know, the problem sure. I have I, with just transition just is transition. that, well, I'll tell you what it is, though, is that that's the term that a lot in the sort of extreme left use to phase out fossil fuels and all the energy mm -hmm. jobs associated with fossil fuels altogether. Whereas the thing we're talking about is transformation, that you're going mm -hmm. to transform the, the way in which you use fossil fuels so that you create more right. of a circular economy. If mm -hmm. you're going to, to burn it, you've got to capture the the CO2 and put it that's back right. yeah, under yeah. the underground. And to me, that should be immaterial. And that's what we're going to move into in our final right. little part oh, yeah. here to, sure, to sure, talk yeah, about whether yeah. that's immaterial. Mm -hmm. But tell me about the just transition. Like, why do you support that sure, terminology? Sure. So, well, I mean, uh, I will use whatever terminology, you know, uh, my counter, my, my dialogue partner likes to talk about my ideas. I'm not fixed to that. Call it the just transformation, if you will. Uh, one reason I think it's just uh, blue hydrogen Low emissions hydrogen, we have to make sure the emissions are low. Um, the, the fugitive emissions thing in Alberta, if I, can, if I can persuade you on any one thing, if you guys can crack that down, maybe have like a $10 million competition to all, you know, open to all students, you know, uh, help us fix this problem, um, then you'll insulate, it's like a bulletproof vest to a lot of the criticisms you'll have. Uh, having read some of the, uh, the literature on Alberta's fugitive methane emissions, my, uh, my advice would be to get yourself that bulletproof vest, you know, fix that up. Now, okay, that's I'm going to tell before you leave that, I'm going to yeah. tell you, I think we're well on our way because I, awesome. I, awesome. I, I'll tell you and I'll tell you how, because mm -hmm. part of the issue with fugitive emissions is it's a pretty expensive process to try mm -hmm. to capture them, put them in a pipeline and take them somewhere useful. So there's two uh, technologies I've heard of that are developing. One is capturing the fugitive emissions and turning them into protein. I met a, a, a business owner in Red Deer who's talking about this. So presumably that would then go into some kind of animal feed. Um, right. And then the next uh, application is catching the emissions and converting exactly. yeah. it into Bitcoin. So there are a number of different okay. companies that are talking sure, sure. about using it to mine Bitcoin on site. And then not only have you captured the emissions, but then you've also created value, which right. becomes yeah. a currency that you can sell. So those are right. just two that I've heard of. I'm sure I'll probably mm -hmm. hear of, of more now that I've mentioned it. But I think that that's really right. key because that's part of the reason for the the paper mm -hmm. that we started off talking about. Uh, yes, why it is right. it it it, it uh, suggested that blue blue hydrogen is mm -hmm. even worse than coal or natural yeah. gas? I think is what they said. That's, that's a bit of a yeah. As I said, this it would be one thing for a hydrogen fuel cell association, you know, lobbyist type guy like me to criticize it. Uh, it's not just me. 
Uh, it is very well respected people from across the political spectrum, people who hate each other, who are uh, very critical of this paper and the, uh, the extrapolations, let's say, which have been put out. Um, now, this isn't, I guess the message I would say is that uh, the best way to counter this is to you know, present the facts and to make sure that Alberta's fugitive emission emissions don't get judged by Texas's. Um, and so um, that's, that would be the, the advice. It, it is, it's one of these things where it's, it's gone viral. You can't really help with that. Uh, you just have to be able to pre present the evidence for why, um, why the whole picture wasn't uh, put forward. It's kind of like that, you know how in Game of Thrones, you don't find out in, until a while later that the guy killed the king because he wanted to murder the whole city. That, that's the kind of thing, you know, it's like you gotta, you got to gruelingly get your way to season three so people will hear the full story. Okay, now we've just spoiled Game of Thrones for anybody who oh, is... Oh, sorry about who, that. Yeah. It's okay. Everybody it should watch it now watch anyway. anyway. Let me let me tell, tell people what you're talking about here. So sure. I'm looking at this New York Times story. For many, hydrogen is the fuel of the future. New research raises doubts. Well, let me just try to read a bit of it here. It says that... A new peer-reviewed study on the climate effects of hydrogen, the most abundant substance in the universe, cast doubt on its role in tackling the greenhouse gas emissions that are the driver of catastrophic global warming. The main stumbling block is that most hydrogen used today is extracted from natural gas in a process that requires a lot of energy and emits, this is their term here, vast amounts of carbon dioxide. Producing natural gas also releases methane, a, potential, a particularly potent greenhouse gas. Um, and, and so he, he, the one of the authors, Robert Howarth, and the other is Mark Jacobson, says to call it zero emissions fuel is totally wrong. What we found is that it's not even low emissions fuel either. Mm -hmm. So I want you to give us a bit of an understanding of who Robert Howarth and Mark Jacobson are, because it's not like they're just sort of independent, innocent bystanders in the academic world, just looking at this through mm -hmm. a neutral lens. They actually have a bit of a history, don't they? Um, they have a history, but I would actually prefer to give my criticisms without addressing their history, because I think the criticism stand out on their own. Uh, I will say that um, in 2015, Mark Jacobson put out this, I thought it was wonderful. I, I, had a few doubts, but broadly wonderful paper that, hey, you know, maybe we could power the whole world with wind, water, uh, hydroelectric, and solar. And um, there were some experts who provided a criticism of it. I think 21 of them got together. And I read the, the criticisms. I was like, yeah, but you can kind of work around that. This is the first go. You know, it's V1.0. You can, you can make a better model. And uh, the very troubling thing was he, uh, he, he launched a defamation suit. Uh, against uh, one of the, the lead author. And that's kind of a red line. Like it's, it's a bit of a red flag. It's not a bit of a red flag, but it is a red flag. And so um, one of the mm, comments on Twitter is, in the energy policy community is like, I'd like to criticize this, but I don't want to get sued. Uh, Bob Howard. But is that a, uh, that's been... what I'm worried about. I must say is I'm worried that that's a tactic that if you threaten a massive ten million dollar lawsuit, then it shuts down the robust debate that needs to happen on this, and then only one side ever gets printed. And it does look like in this New York Times article that only one mm -hmm. side did end up getting printed. They go on to say that right, the Hydrogen right. Council, an industry group founded in 2017 mm -hmm. that includes so on and so on and so forth. Couldn't be mm -hmm. me, re, couldn't be reached for immediate comment. Mm -hmm. So they didn't. Maybe they tried, but they certainly didn't wait until they went to publication to be able to get the mm -hmm. counter view. And that's to me disappointing as well. Calm. Oh, did we? Sorry, Mar sorry, Matthew, I, I we've frozen you again. Try. So you were going to tell us who um, Robert Hoberth, uh, uh, Robert, Robert Hoberth is as well. Uh, Howarth. Many academics who are willing to speak, often off the record for fear of litigation. Um, I believe that the sort of counter effect, the unintended consequence of the lawsuit is that uh, many people, uh, many policymakers rather, simply write it off and say, okay, well, he's making this noise, but these serious people have made very cogent arguments that you know these errors have to be fixed in, in his earlier paper or there are drawbacks. And even if there isn't a public response, the policy uh, response is, is, isn't as dominant as you might think on the in the air war, maybe, in, in the broader media. Uh, Bob Howarth. Now, Bob Howarth did some amazingly good work uh, looking into fugitive methane emissions. 
Uh, I think he had a 2011 paper where, where no one had really looked at this. He took a hard look at that. And uh, you know, he has to get credit for that. The one thing that he has gotten a lot of criticism for is his focus on a 20-year time frame instead of a 100-year time frame. Hmm. On a 20-year time frame, in the worst situations, yeah, maybe natural gas causes more global warming than coal. But in the 100-year, even the 30-year time frame, the 40, the 200-year, seven generations time frame, coal is a lot, lot worse. Like a lot, lot worse. You can you can use the 20-year time frame to make a very compelling urgent case for reducing fugitive methane emissions. You don't want to be in the spot where you say you're saying that natural gas is worse than coal, because then China can say, well, why are you complaining we're building natural <laughs> gas plants? We're totally. building coal. That's what you told me to do. Um, I guess, you know, on the on the 20 year time frame, 2001 to 20, 2021, eh, communism looks pretty good. Look at all the people who've brought prosperity in China. I mean, from my own family, you know, if you go back to 1921 on the 100 year time scale, communism looks a lot worse, like a lot worse. So, and so, so, um, yeah. so Mark, what I'm oh, sorry, Michael, ah, Matthew, pardon me, got all these <laughs> names intermingled in my brain. Let me let me put up the um, the graph sure. that you show so that, that you sent me because sure, sure. there is a graph that they put in the paper that others have taken to looking at and saying this if you put proper assumptions in place. Mm -hmm it completely changes the picture. So let me see if sure. I can uh, properly share this. And uh, yeah. I hope I'm, I'm sharing it. You oh, can see it all absolutely. right, can you? I can okay. see it, yes. So, so okay. let's go through, before we talk about the, the drawing that's been written in there, show, tell, mm -hmm. explain what the initial um, findings were that, that appeared in this, in this peer-reviewed paper. Explain, uh, explain what, the, what it's showing here. Sure, so what it's showing here is that Coal is on the far right. Haha, <laughs> far right. I love that term. Okay, so coal is on the far right. And you can see on, this, on the yellow bar is the CO2 emissions that come from burning coal. Uh, the little bit of red is fugitive methane emissions from coal production because there, there is a little bit of fugitive methane that gets released from that. But, and let me keep those numbers. So we're looking at around uh, 100 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule, just so people understand right. what the what the measure is. And I see what you're saying about why the time frame is so important, because mm -hmm. in the case of coal, since it has fewer fugitive emissions of methane, the bigger issue is going to be the CO2. So that makes some sense. And then that's go on right. to the next one. So next is diesel oil. And I think that's mm -hmm. just included because uh, it's a liquid fuel. You know, coal is a solid. Um, and so here you see that there are fewer CO2 emissions. There's still a little bit of a fugitive methane, uh, probably from natural gas used in the refining process. But you can see it's less bad. Less than, than coal. coal. That's interesting because I've often wondered why it is that diesel uh, engines are, are seen to be better than gasoline engines. And, and, and perhaps this provides a little bit of a, an answer, even though it doesn't look like gasoline's on here. But we do have natural gas as the mm -hmm. next one. In, the, in their right. study, it looks mm -hmm. like it's worse than diesel. And mm -hmm. in this case... Well, equivalent to coal, coal. But, but a different That's but a right. different mix. Right. So now what this shows is natural gas. And you can see that the CO2 bar from natural gas is much lower than the coal. It's, it's not quite one half. The yellow part of the natural gas, if you pull it across the screen, you're about one half the size of the coal CO2, the coal yellow bar. And the that makes sense. That mm -hmm. makes some sense to me because when we've heard that converting from coal to natural gas saves on CO2 emissions, it's on the combustion right. side, but there's still this mm -hmm. problem of, of uh, fugitive emissions of methane that has to, have right. to be dealt with. Got it. And, and so so I'll just use the, the, the yellow bars now for, for various forms of hydrogen. Uh, we have uh, the gray hydrogen. Well, we'll, I'll just say that the hydrogen, you could uh, see it to be a little bit higher, a little bit lower than natural gas. That's the, just, just for the sake of a uh, I tend to ramble and, and go uh, way off time. Um, but nat blue hydrogen, ballpark, we'll call that uh, natural gas. Now, the reason that you're able to say that natural gas is worse than coal, now this is a 20 year, not a 100 year time scale. Uh, the, the UN is considering using 20 and 100 year site to science to get the context. The red bar for fugitive methane emissions is really big after, uh, uh, after 20 years. It's really small over 100 years. And so what happens is that um, you even on a so um, the tricky thing is that methane, it, its half life in the atmosphere is about 12 years. And so what looks terrible in the short term, it's not good to have extra emissions, is, is, is more manageable uh, mm -hmm. in the long term because it decays. It, uh, it, it doesn't stick around forever. 
Uh, and so when you add the red bars, and this is, this is on the original chart, uh, the global warming effect of, uh, of the fugitive methane emissions. Yeah, you get natural gas looking bad. You get blue hydrogen uh, and gray hydrogen looking worse because you use extra natural gas to produce a certain amount of hydrogen. You're not capturing you know, other energy. And so they managed to make hydrogen of various colors look worse than natural gas. Now, there are a few problems with this. That uh, This was pointed out in a paper by, uh, oh, I think it was like Danielle Mateo on LinkedIn. I, I, I think I sent over the link. Now, one problem in this is that, oh, sorry. Um, oh, do you want uh, me to put it back up again? Oh, sure. Oh, yes, I, yes, please. Sorry, sorry, I thought you had finished talking to it. So oh, I'll, no. uh, I'll uh, I just want up. to go through the, the revised lines that okay. uh, an academic with more experience in this sector uh, had put forward. The first is that um, we live in a world or parts of the world where fugitive methane emissions aren't regulated. And um, the future uh, is definitely a world of regulations. A number of large uh, worldwide producers have promised to hit 0.2% fugitive methane emissions. These, this red bar for natural gas is based off of 3.5%. Um, oh, just that's dramatically it. more. Well, that's right. And so, so here, that's the reason for this natural gas. It says revised NG down here. That's the reason you have this very small fugitive methane emission still on the 20 year time scale. Uh, and the way to look at this is that the fugitive methane emissions, even on this 20 year time scale, which mm, not entirely comfortable with, even on this 20 year time scale, this is like skating to where the puck used to be. Uh, we are, we are now living in a world where more and more countries are pricing carbon and where there are going to be not just through regulation, but companies not wanting to look like the black sheep who are going to be uh, regulating and, and controlling fusion methane emissions. So if you want to skate to where the puck will be, then it's this revised NG uh, chart here. And you can see that it is uh, considerably uh, less bad, less emissions intense, even on the 20 year time scale than coal. And then uh, with the with the gray hydrogen, well, that basically knocks down all of these uh, these other red bars for the hydrogen. But one more thing this fellow pointed out is, uh, and I wasn't aware of this, so this this fellow more expert than I am. Uh, one of the assumptions that uh, Jacobson and Howard made uh, was that the steam methane reformer with the with a carbon capture unit would uh, would only capture about eighty percent of the CO two, and that it would be operated in a certain energy inefficient way. Now, if you work in any refinery, any chemical process, you know that that is, that that is like efficiency, making use of every resource is absolutely key. And so in the real world with gray hydrogen, you see uh, this revised gray H2, the actual fugitive meth methane emissions are lower because they don't use natural gas to power, uh, uh, to, to power some of these other processes. Um, and similarly with the blue hydrogen down here, revised blue hydrogen, you can see it's, it's absolutely tiny. And the, the, there are several reasons for this. Um, I guess the, 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 the sum would be that the, the, the net net is that um, the authors uh, do not appear to have had a very good peer review from the chemical mm -hmm. industry side uh, on on the, how they think these reactors, these, these chemical processes work. Well, what I would say is that even with the revision, I mean, even with these numbers, and I'll, can I stop sharing now? Do you mind? Oh, yeah, if yeah, I, sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. With these numbers, it does seem to me that even with this new technology, you can you can reduce emissions even of the of the gray hydrogen by fifty percent, and certainly looks oh, like more. you can reduce yeah. blue hydrogen by gosh, it almost looks like eighty percent. So this is getting us to the point where uh, we keep getting told by those who want to solve this problem that this could actually solve the problem. We're getting to the point where you, you really are getting below mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, I think our current These target in Canada yeah. is 40 to 45% below 2005 mm -hmm. levels by, by right. 2030. I mean, with, with these kind of applications, you actually can get mm -hmm. there. So uh, I'm glad you mentioned that 80% just to, to, to just uh, do a callback momentarily. So, Air Products recently announced their, their target blue hydrogen facility for the year 2024. Uh, and they had the Pembina Institute, an arm's length ENGO, you know, do an independent GHG analysis to say, you know, are our numbers correct? And they said they would capture 95% of the CO2 produced in the process. So 
in the now this in this paper did do this this paper did do a, a appropriate job of doing a sensitivity analysis you know what if we're too pessimistic what if we're too optimistic their best case scenario for carbon capture using this energy process which doesn't reflect reality was 90 percent hmm. now the air products announcement came out maybe after they submitted the paper but um yeah 95 percent that is a, a Again, skating to where the puck used to be, you know, with some assumptions that weren't great versus skating to where the puck will be. Uh, and, and so I think that's, that's one lesson. Um, again, if you don't price carbon, if no one's, you know, looking at fugitive methane emission, of course, they're going to be highs. There's no economic value. It's just not the world we're going to be living in, the world we're living in today. So Matthew, I guess this is the real problem is that the, the paper's now out there. It's been peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. It's been in the New York Times. And so does it set the standard or do you think that there was enough critique of it that uh, you, you've, you've, you've got a genuine debate happening in the scientific sure. community? Uh, I think the debate will be in the sort of policy sector, you know, that, you know, that, that got the coverage just like, it's like Donald Trump got like a hundred times more coverage than Bernie Sanders in his 2016 run. You just have to live with that, right? You got you to react with that. So, you know, the, the respondents aren't going to get the same amount of coverage as mm. this paper got. Fair enough. Um, I think the big discussion now is going to be uh, for the policymakers, do, does the more representative science win out? That's kind of what I'm hoping to help move forward and many other policy analysts who aren't even you know, all that fond of hydrogen, uh, or does the common, does the mean win out? Mm -hmm. And again, from my outreach with, uh, with electric vehicles, especially, um, it's, a, it's a matter of being patient, listening to people's concerns. I'm sure you know, there has been greenwashing in many industries in the past. Um, I have to be civil and uh, respectful uh, of the concerns enough, you know, much as you know, doing occasional outreach on the right side of the spectrum. Uh, to be able to convey what I think are appropriate uh, ways of digesting this information and proposing what I think is a more accurate and better path forward. Tell, tell me what you think ought to happen, because this is what I'm observing, is that we're, after years of being polarized, I'm beginning to feel like there are a lot of allies among reasonable environmental groups with, who mm -hmm. are looking at the science and are looking at ways in which the uh, fossil fuel industry can transform to mm -hmm. meet the outcomes that, that we all want. Right. Yes, right. And there does seem to be a, a, a well of, of goodwill there among, among some environmental groups. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering how, how do we, how, how do we uh, create a bit more of a partnership on that? I'll, and the, men, the, the reason I mention it is because there was on July the 19th, 500 environmental groups signed on to a letter saying don't look at carbon capture storage and utilization mm -hmm. to both the U.S. Congress and the Canadian mm -hmm. Parliament and it's gone unanswered so far and I, I mm -hmm. think we've, we've got to answer these we've got to do the rebuttal in the New York Times and we've got to put a mm -hmm. paper out that puts the 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 uh, the issue of blue hydrogen in the proper context with the new technology mm -hmm. and we've got to answer the question about mm -hmm. uh, the concerns they have about carbon capture utilization and storage. What would be your recommendation about how mm -hmm. to start building those those alliances? I guess we won't talk about, you know, politics. <laughs> right. <laughs> I would yes, not yes. have been a Bernie Sanders supporter. That probably does not right, surprise right, you. Right, right. But, well, but, but, mm -hmm. but how, do we, how do we find some common cause and things we can agree on? Sure. I guess I'd say that uh, I'm probably the only Bernie Sanders supporter who bet a friend, a Jeopardy, three-time Jeopardy champion friend, three-night Jeopardy champion friend that that if Clinton won the nomination, Trump would find a way to beat her, and I won that bet. Uh, despite being on the far left, just just again, you know, Trump had this. That shows how fair-minded anyway. you are that you're able to sort of look at the trends and the data and see which way they were going. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I was I was tempted to cancel the bet, but I am a very stubborn guy. I guess the way to make the the, the way to make uh, allies and to find a common ground, I think. I can only speak from my experience, but in being able to try to see from other people's views and perspectives. Uh, I do think there's a very fertile ground of, of uh, probably a vast majority of Canadians and many environmental groups, uh, self-described environmental groups who are very interested in, in not you know, doing a holier than thou routine. And you know, every side does that, you know, we're good, they're bad. Uh, I think that 
finding areas of common ground, um, you know, this thing on flourishing, uh, for example, uh, is, is a path forward. And then maybe when one is tempted to be critical of the other side, one not say, well, every environmentalist or every oil worker, and rather say, well, in this particular case, X, Y, Z is in the wrong. I think that many of the people who follow them on social media would agree that, you know, we want prosperity. We want, you know, more park area. We want, um, we want to improve agricultural productivity so we can have more forested area for, you know, the, the massive number of uh, wildlife creatures in Canada to flourish. Uh, and so maybe those would be a couple of my suggestions. Uh, it's been a learning process for me and I've been at this for many years. Uh, I still lash out, but uh, I, I have found it is much more fruitful to find areas of common ground. I think ultimately there is a lot of common ground. And if I'm not sort of, you know, insulting or calling names to the other side, maybe they stop doing that of me. And then maybe we can eventually see, okay, well, we can agree on these things and we'll, uh, you know, we'll fight each other on different battles after we win those, you know, first steps. It, it doesn't, it's, it's difficult to um, find those reasonable minded individuals when mm. you have even people uh, like the the UN chief, Anthony Guitaris, is mm. saying that this sounds the death knell for fossil fuels. It's not a very balanced way of talking mm. about this issue. And so I guess, I guess that's what I'm a little bit concerned about is that mm -hmm. the level of, um, of, of hype and anxiety and rhetoric has, has become so extreme. The mm. sense I'm getting for you is very much along the lines of my sense as well is innovation can solve pretty well any problem given mm -hmm. an, an, enough of a, a, of a time horizon. And if mm. we're looking out to 2050, the entire world can change in that period of time. Right. But I feel like politicians are keep keep on trying to move the target back to something that's unachievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I think there's zero chance that we'll be able to to uh, to, to convert entirely away from fossil fuels by 2030, which seems mm -hmm. to me the aspiration of some of those in Extinction Rebellion, right. and seems to right. have some currency among uh, among currently mm -hmm. elected officials. So, what uh, what what is your thinking about how to to try to bring the temperature down on that? Sure. Um, I guess one suggestion I might have is that anytime someone talks about, uh, you know, the end of fossil fuels and cut off of fossil fuels, maybe mentally just replace that with fossil fuel combustion. So, you know, I've donated blood. I have family members who have received blood transfusions. Uh, plastics are made from oil and gas. Uh, you can't have, you know, you can't have those technologies without some fossil fuels. It's just that you don't use them as fuels which burn CO2. Uh, or which where the CO2 is released. And so I think that um, maybe reframing that mentally, just as a mental note, uh, maybe that helps give a little bit more room for the, uh, I think Martin Luther King called the Satyagraha. I think he, he got that from Gandhi. So it's just this sort of overarching love of humanity, even of the people who oppose you, where um, I think, you know, end of fossil fuels is a shorthand. It's a deliberate, necessary contraction of, you know, fossil fuel combustion where the CO2 gets, gets, gets left, gets, uh, you know, vented to atmosphere. And if we're, if, if on your side, if you're able to keep the temperature down long enough, then ultimately what they're worried about is the CO2. If you can demonstrate paths to using this, you know, concentrated energy in a manner that doesn't release CO2 to the atmosphere, uh, in, you know, using sources that they are you know, more likely to be, you know, engaged with. They're not going to believe CAP, you know, CAP uh, uh, puts out something, but, you know, maybe there's maybe Pembina or, or some other group will have some research. It takes time. You need to build that trust and that evidence with the, the third party groups, the non-aligned groups. Uh, and then I would suggest that's the approach. Uh, and also with respect to that bullet, uh, you know, bulletproof armor um, example, um, you know, demonstrating and then being able to brag about, well, look, we've, we've cut our, you know, our emissions by X much. If you can say, you know, don't, no one would judge Alberta's reproductive rights record based on Texas's. If you can get to a point where you can say it's ridiculous to judge Alberta's fugitive methane emissions by Texas's, then you're in a good place, right? Because you'll be ideally best in class. It'll take years probably for that message to, to convey in osmosis through the population, but uh, if you can, I don't know, if, if, 
in my case, if I can hold my tongue against right wingers long enough to get to those points of commonality, I have a chance to, you know, at least be in less opposition to them. Let me let me pose some language to you too, because I like what you've said, end of fossil fuel combustion, because I've often thought, even if we do convert to electric vehicles, you're still going to need asphalt to drive your your vehicles mm -hmm. on. And that base of that comes from from mm -hmm. uh, from bitumen and another, another yeah, heavy right. crude. And so that's not a bad way of thinking about it. Let me post some wording by you and you can tell me if you think that there's a problem with it. The way I've been sure. thinking about our challenge on continuing to use fossil fuels is that we've got to reduce. And I think we all know what reduce looks like. We've got mm -hmm. to reuse. And that's what we've been talking about. Is there ways that you can infuse it into the concrete or you can create carbon black or mm -hmm. carbon nanofiber that could be a steel construction mm -hmm. or, yeah. or industrial minerals. So the, mm -hmm. reduce, reuse, and then return. And if there is some combustion, make sure that you're capturing it and returning it back to the earth where you found mm -hmm. it. So those are the three R's that I'm that I'm contemplating on this mm -hmm. because I don't know if we will get to a point where every use of fossil fuels will not have a combustion of a component mm -hmm. to it. But if we get to a point where even if you are combusting, you're capturing everything and returning mm -hmm. it underground to a tune of 95% as technology improves, maybe 100%, that mm -hmm. seems to be a pretty good outcome. Uh, I think that would be a good outcome. My suggestion, now I think that would probably work very well with right-wing audiences, because I mean, you came up with it, that's, that's your community. Uh, I think that um, if you want to do outreach to sort of more neutral communities, you'd have to figure out what, what makes them tick. Uh, I think the very, uh, you know, thinking of myself, uh, I would want to see, you know, data and trends. Um, it is not well known, but uh, you know the the bitumen coming out of Alberta now is less GHG intensive than than a number of uh, of uh, of grades of American oil. Uh, with these blue hydrogen projects, you know, using real world data, they will be less emitting. Um, but you have to you have to get that data. You have to do the work to do that, mm -hmm. and then demonstrate the reasons for confidence, and then sort of edge into that conversation. Uh, so that um, you know, so that you don't uh, you know burn the bridges of any goodwill that you might have had to begin with, I suppose. Okay, one more thing. I'm going to try to get you sure, sure. to convince one sure, of my right wing friends. So I've got a sure, friend sure, yeah, yeah. who is in who, who is in a, a natural gas business, and I was as I was mm -hmm. talking to him about it, how my enthusiasm about hydrogen mm -hmm. and my enthusiasm for carbon capture mm -hmm. and utilization, his attitude. Uh, he, his his point back to me was, mm -hmm. but isn't it just more cost effective to use the natural gas and not go through all of these interim steps? Mm -hmm. And I, I, in some ways, you, I'm wondering if we're in the same kind of argument that we were with using uh, with creating ethanol out of agricultural mm -hmm. products. Is oh, that yeah, sometimes you're using more energy to mm -hmm. create the ethanol than the ethanol right, produces? Yeah. And are we mm -hmm. in danger of going down that same track that we're, we're, we're doing the, the same kind of thing, but it, in, in point of fact, it actually might just make more sense to, to use the natural exactly. gas. So my response with that, to that would be, uh, would be uh, carbon price and Adam Smith. So if you make the CO2 emissions expensive enough, yeah, if you, if you pull off the hydrogen from the natural gas and you turn this carbon to CO2, you lose some of the energy, you lose a, a decent chunk of the energy. Uh, but if, as a society, we value not releasing that CO2, then that, that winds up being economically uh, you know, sensible. So um, what your friend is saying makes perfect sense in a no-carbon price world. That's just not the world that uh, we are living in now, and that's the opposite of what the world we're heading towards is. So, Especially when we're looking at the, the high price in, in Canada in particular, $170 mm -hmm. per ton. Coming, yeah. All right. Thank you so Which much for walking us through this analysis. I sure appreciate your time today. You're very welcome. All right. That was Matthew Klippenstein. As I mentioned before, he's with the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. Thanks again for your time today. Sure appreciate it. All right, folks. So there you have it. Everything you ever wanted to know about hydrogen. We are out of time for today. There were a couple of little glitches just in Matthew's uh, um, connection. I'll see if I can I can fix that up in the audio. But if you want, if you missed any part of this, we had to start a little bit early today for those who were tu tuning in later. We're going to keep on moving back the time until I can get to, to 9 a.m. and we'll probably start doing that in the fall. But if you did miss anything, 
then you can uh, either go back and watch this on YouTube on our YouTube page, or you can also go to podcasts, uh, get that on Spotify, Google, or Apple, anywhere you get your podcast. I'm Danielle Smith, president of the Albert Enterprise Group, and we'll see you again next time. Thank <laughs> you.